Tonight, a Canadian Army reservist missing for months. Now he's in FBI custody. An alleged recruiter for a neo-Nazi group. Investigators say he had a gun and was ready to use it. A mysterious SARS-like virus spreads beyond China. We need to be uh, more willing to engage That's what we're in a more to. radical way. Undercover inside the anti-vaccine movement. At issue on the conservative leadership race, who's in, who's out, and the Harper factor. This is The National. Patrick Matthews has been found. The former Canadian Army reservist disappeared five months ago. That was after being exposed as a member of a militant neo-Nazi organization known as The Base. Now, he's been arrested and appeared today in a Maryland court. He's facing charges along with two Americans. Karen Pauls has the alarming allegations of what he's been up to, including tales of a machine gun, 1,600 rounds of ammunition, and talk of committing acts of violence. Court sketches show Patrick Matthews looking unkempt, a far cry from his clean-cut Army Reserve look just five months ago. He spoke few words as he and his co-defendants faced charges, including transporting a firearm to commit a felony. The last time we saw Matthews, he was living in Bozizer, a small town an hour east of Winnipeg. <coughs> Police had just raided his house and seized some firearms. Soon after, Matthews was released from the Canadian Army, where he was a reservist with explosives training. RCMP and the military were investigating his alleged role as a recruiter for the neo-Nazi group The Base when Matthews went underground. This is a group that's been talking about committing acts of violence for a very long time. The FBI alleges they made a functioning assault rifle, bought 1,650 rounds of ammunition, and practiced at a local gun range. Agents say they talked about recruitment, creating a white ethno state, and military style training camps. We're seeing threats of violence. Just yesterday, Virginia's governor declared a state of emergency, temporarily banning all weapons around the state capitol. He cited intelligence that out-of-state militia groups and hate groups were planning to attend a pro-gun rally there on Monday. They are not coming to peacefully protest. They are coming to intimidate and to cause harm. The governor fears a repeat of the violence in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017, which injured 28 people and killed one. There will be a significant number of similar-minded people at this rally that also have access to weapons and could be another Charlottesville-esque type situation. Back in the summer, Matthew's boss told us he didn't think his employee was a danger to others. Reached today, his grandmother didn't know about the arrests. She was just grateful he's still alive. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Canada's foreign affairs minister hosted a meeting in London today, bringing together countries that lost citizens in Flight 752. Margaret Evans tells us what they want from Iran. From a single flame to five each representing one of the nations meeting here in mourning today. On the wall behind them, the names of all the victims, including those from Iran. But it was also the launch of a battle plan, a pledge from these five countries to find answers, even if it takes years. Canada's foreign minister said Iran's cooperation will be judged each step of the way. The greatest leverage to come from a watching world, he said. It's called the international community. The eyes of the international community are in Iran today. Inside Iran, they are still burying their dead. These images are of a funeral in the city of Hamedan. Others have been marked with anger against Iran's leadership. Some people for the second day in a row reportedly refusing to drape the bodies of their loved ones in the Iranian flag. Abroad, Iran's foreign minister Javid Zarif made the diplomatic rounds after European countries accused Tehran of abandoning a 2015 deal on controlling Iran's nuclear capabilities. There are worries that tensions will hinder the joint investigation just launched 
and efforts to assist with the repatriation of remains. The Dutch foreign minister was invited to the London meeting to share the Netherlands' experience trying to prosecute those who shot down a Malaysian airliner over eastern Ukraine in 2014. I advised uh, the, the ministers to be prepared for uh, the interference of, of geopolitics and, and the search for, for truth and justice. Justice, accountability, transparency and closure. That's what the ministers gathered here today promised for the victims and their families. Whether it's theirs to deliver, though, is the question. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. The process of repatriating remains has begun for one or two Canadians killed in Flight 752. The Prime Minister's Parliamentary Secretary revealed that today on CBC News Power and Politics. When the Prime Minister had an unprecedented conversation with the uh, President of Iran, he emphasized and stressed the point of uh, granting the wishes of the families. The Iranian President assured the Prime Minister uh, that those wishes will be respected. Tomorrow morning, Justin Trudeau is scheduled to update Canadians on issues around the downing of the plane. Winter in Canada is packing a nasty punch. Millions of people from coast to coast are either digging out or bracing for what's next. Now in B.C., the story is snow. Lots of it compared to what they're used to getting. And now the south coast is getting ready for rain. So crews are working around the clock to clean up before the next system moves in. Meanwhile, across the prairies, the deep freeze continues. Temperatures in Edmonton this morning were colder than they were in the South Pole. Think about that for a second. But the big story right now is in Newfoundland and Labrador. A blizzard is expected to hit tonight. Some areas could see up to 70 centimeters of snow, wind gusts up to 150 kilometers an hour, and a powerful storm surge. Now, with the storm just hours away, Meg Roberts shows us how St. John's is getting ready. The shovels are flying off the shelves as people here brace for a brutal 24 hours. We're getting too old for this. <laughs> They're stocking up on kerosene, butane, anything to keep warm if the power goes out, and anything to keep busy on a snow day. Paint is selling fast. People think on a storm day, what else am I going to do? I'm going to paint. I'm going to get that project done that I never got done before. Officials certainly want people to stay at home and off the roads. Heavy snow, high winds, even flooding and storm surges in some areas could be dangerous. Our message, I guess, would be quite simple. If you do not need to be out tomorrow, stay in. The province has already seen an unusual amount of snow, 170 centimeters since December. The sidewalks so packed that some people have been forced to walk on busy streets. There's been a spike in accidents. The mayor is calling for patience. It has been challenging. We do understand there's a lot of frustration out there. There's a lot of frustration in the city uh, with, with the snow and, uh, and, and with the sidewalks and the roads. Plows are being brought from the west to help, and crews were out today trying to clear what they could before the province gets slammed again. The streets were packed with people, too, racing out to get last-minute supplies to ride out the storm. Bread, milk, and an essential for every blizzard, storm chips. I pack down with whatever I can, usually uh, anything that don't need to be cooked, just in case power goes. This is a lot of elbow grease, and we'll get through it. <laughs> The public schools have made the rare decision to close tomorrow. Municipal buildings will be shuttered, airlines have cancelled flights, and the Metro bus will not be running. Officials say they will do what they can to get the province back up and running by Monday. But as of now, it all lies in the hands of Mother Nature. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Storm chips, good idea. Uh, let's head to BC's south coast, where people are still digging out from that rare snowfall. So this was the scene in Surrey today, that's southeast of Vancouver. Lots of people still clearing their driveways and sidewalks. Some areas are expecting more snow, but the big concern now is rain, up to 70 millimeters in the forecast. So city crews are trying to clear snow and drains to prevent potential flooding. This week I sort of challenged myself to uh, not take any uh, easy outs and just force myself out into the weather and see if I could deal with it. 
Oh my gosh. Uh, brave soul running to work through blowing snow and frigid temperatures. It was minus 30 in Edmonton this morning and a fresh layer of snow made roads extra slick. This morning alone, 70 collisions reported to police. In Manitoba, many schools were closed because of the cold and that Arctic air is expected to stick around right through the weekend. Now to Washington, where the U.S. Senate is ready to put the president on trial. The question now is what senators will be allowed to hear. A battle is brewing over new evidence from an associate of Rudy Giuliani. As Katie Simpson reports, it could place Giuliani and Donald Trump right in the thick of the intrigue in Ukraine. The fate of the president now rests here. Raise your right hand. The Supreme Court justice sworn in, 100 senators now acting as jurors in Donald Trump's trial. You will do impartial justice according to the Constitution and laws, so help you God. Arguments begin Tuesday, and it's still unknown whether new witnesses and evidence will be admitted. Democrats are demanding it be allowed based partially on the claims of this man. President Trump knew exactly what was going on. Lev Parnas has been indicted on campaign fraud crimes, though he once worked closely with the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. In a series of TV interviews, Parnas says he was part of the alleged pressure campaign to convince Ukraine to announce an investigation into Trump's political rival, Joe Biden, as a way to help the president's re-election campaign. That was the way everybody viewed it. I mean, there was, that was the most important thing, is for him to stay on for another four years. I don't know him at all. The president distanced himself from Parnas, saying they only crossed paths at a fundraiser. I don't need the help of a man that I never met before, other than perhaps taking a picture. But Parnas has given lawmakers extensive text messages and emails showing he appears to have been deeply involved in the affair, including a plot to fire the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. Though he dismissed concerns, some text messages he received suggested Marie Ivanovich was under surveillance. Claims so startling, Ukraine is launching a criminal investigation. Ukraine cannot ignore such a legal fact on its territory. Adding to the president's already difficult day, a nonpartisan watchdog organization says the White House broke the law on an issue at the core of impeachment. It says it was illegal for the president to put a hold on hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to Ukraine because Congress had already approved it. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. On a day President Trump needed a win on Capitol Hill, he got one. In the midst of all that solemn ceremony, the Senate also managed to approve the new North American free trade deal. The United States-Mexico-Canada agreement is a major achievement for President Trump and a very big bipartisan win for the American people. And the legislation passed easily with a strong bipartisan support. It includes tougher laws on labor and the automotive industry. Canada still needs to approve the deal sometime after Parliament resumes later this month. A new virus that claimed at least two lives in China has now been detected in Japan, and that has infectious disease specialists on high alert, especially because the coronavirus, as it's called, is connected to another illness Canadians remember all too well, SARS. Christine Birak takes a look. Further confirmation. The outbreak of a new viral pneumonia in China is on the move. A man in his 30s arrived in Tokyo with a cough and high fever. He's now recovering. So too is another traveler in Thailand. Both had visited Wuhan, the Chinese city where investigators confirmed at least 41 people are sick with the mysterious new virus. Two men in their 60s have died. Investigators say most, but not all of the patients, spent time at this seafood market in Wuhan that sells live and dead animals. They're likely the source of this infection. But the question now is, can it spread from person to person? So far, no one knows. It's really too early to be confident about what the disease looks like. Investigators say they're dealing with a new type of coronavirus, placing it in the same family as severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, which killed nearly 800 people, including 44 Canadians almost 20 years ago. If you think about the initial cases of SARS, the case fatality rate was much higher. So it looks like this virus is less severe. Tokyo, Japan, uh, Taipei, Hong Kong. 
Infectious disease doctor Isaac Bogosh can predict where the illness will be detected next. Unlike during SARS, China is quickly sharing information. That's also enabling scientists to create tests for the new coronavirus. It's extremely important that uh, we be wary of infections that might be acquired on uh, distant lands that might land on our doorstep. In just over a week, Lunar New Year celebrations will see millions of people traveling within China and around the world. Health Canada says hospitals are on alert and that anyone arriving from an affected country who is experiencing flu-like symptoms should notify authorities immediately. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. The funeral for former politician and Lieutenant Governor John Crosby was held today in St. John's. In a ceremony broadcast across Canada, no surprise there given his career and personality. Crosby's affections were rooted in his home province, but as Chris O'Neill Yates tells us, his life's work, public service and charisma were felt nationwide. Prime Ministers, past and present, as well as Premiers political friends and foes. All joined the Crosby family in tribute to a legendary Newfoundlander and proud Canadian. There will not be another politician like John Crosby ever in the history of the country. They heard a eulogy from Brian Mulroney, Crosby's friend, colleague and boss. If a Prime Minister of Canada is lucky, and I mean really lucky, he gets to have a John Crosby in his cabinet. One, not two. <laughs> From Crosby's politician son, recognition for the woman at the heart of his dad's life. Mom, in this world, there could be no more powerful example of the strength and beauty of joining two people than your strong union over the past 68 years. Inside, the cathedral was filled to capacity. The reason why? spoken clearly outside it. It was like dealing with another comedian. He, he had impeccable timing. Uh, he came prepared. He knew what he wanted to do. And wasn't afraid to fight for it. I mean, one of the things I've been reflecting on, and I'm here with my husband, is uh, he was a champion of LGBTQ rights. Uh, he, ch he changed. He made amendments to the Canada Human Rights Code to make sure that there was no uh, discrimination based on sexual orientation in the federal civil service, the military, the RCMP. Bill Galton knew Crosby from his city council days. But he had a thousand people would take a bullet for him. There's not many politicians could say that. That's a quality John Crosby earned the old-fashioned way. He stood with his friends when times were good, and he was steadfast and true when times were not. The measure of a life well-lived, of a man well-loved. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. Okay, we have more news ahead on The National. A CBC Marketplace investigation goes undercover inside the anti-vaccination movement. Canadians are so half a And the Conservative leadership race is underway. Who's in, who's out, and who's behind the scenes? Rosie's here with that issue. Plus, what could Harry and Meghan's new life in Canada cost Canadians? We're back in two minutes. Welcome back. Nearly half of all Canadians have at least some concern about vaccine safety. That is according to the research foundation Welcome Global Monitor. For public health officials, dispelling that doubt is critical to protecting people, but there's a whole movement pushing in the other direction. Tonight, Marketplace's Asha Tomlinson takes us inside the anti-vaccine movement. We're at a massive anti-vax rally in Washington. This is a war for our children. With some of the biggest leaders. Why would we trust them? Andrew Wakefield, his bogus study in the 90s, famously linked vaccines to autism. And Del Bigtree, a controversial filmmaker, speaker, and host. So if you're telling your clients vaccine injuries don't happen, you are a moron. The movement goes far beyond this rally. It's a massive misinformation campaign online, contributing to a culture of vaccine hesitancy, now a global health crisis. Nearly half of Canadians have concerns about vaccine safety. 
people around the world have stopped vaccinating because of the, the rhetoric that they've read online. Outbreaks of measles are occurring and people are actually dying. The risks of vaccination are actually very small. One in a million may get a severe anaphylactic or severe allergic reaction to the vaccine, but even that is, is treatable. Rolling. We want to understand the tactics used to get people on side. That's why we're undercover at this VIP anti-vax event. People are quick to share their opinions. Canadians are so apathetic. We need to be uh, more willing to engage That's what we're in a more to. radical way. And others reveal social media strategies to avoid being flagged on sites like Facebook. Like we need to not put vaccine even in the name whatsoever. You can't search our name and take what will come up. At the end of the event, we catch up with Dell Bigtree. There are multiple studies with hundreds of thousands of Name subjects one. that there was one, one in 2016 and one in 2019. That said what? Hundreds of thousands of subjects that said there's no link between the MMR vaccine and autism. The are they study. untrue? Uh, it's bad science. That's what I would say. Don't do anything you're not sure about. Don't do anything. A common anti-vax tactic and one of the most powerful. We have to be able to remind people what vaccines are, why they're important and how safe they are. Dr. Dubay says that's why facts matter. Asha Tomlinson, CBC News, Toronto. And you can watch Asha's full investigation tomorrow on CBC's Marketplace at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland on CBC Television and CBC Gen. Okay, now to some other stories making news across Canada tonight. We are all of the view to dismiss the appeal for the unanimous reasons of the Court of Appeal for British Columbia. A big legal victory today for supporters of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. In a rare ruling from the bench, Canada's top court unanimously shut down British Columbia's case for a law that would have effectively killed the expansion project. This means the BC Court of Appeal opinion will now stand barring the province from enacting laws that would affect a federal infrastructure project. And in Ontario, while a lot of families are bracing for one-day teacher strikes, the Premier is pointing the finger at union leaders. I support the hard-working men and women that, that teach our children every single day. I think they're, uh, they don't have good leadership. Ford is blaming them for the labour dispute gripping Ontario's education system. All of the province's major teachers' unions are now in various states of escalated job action, ranging from rotating strikes to work to rule campaigns. The way things are going, next Monday and Tuesday, close to a million students will likely be out of class. No, it's delightful when your city spends all of this money for a transit system that doesn't work. Frustration in Ottawa today, as commuters dealt with yet another failure on the city's five-month-old light rail system. A broken overhead electrical wire was blamed for bringing trains to a halt this morning, leaving thousands of people waiting for buses. The city says repairs are underway, but disruptions could extend into tomorrow morning. Up next, an investigation into one of the wealthiest people in this country. Quebec dairy mogul Lino Saputo has long denied ties to the mafia, but we have new police evidence that suggests otherwise. And later, Prince Harry's first public appearance since he and Meghan triggered something of a royal crisis. We're back after the break. Canadian Lino Saputo, founder of one of the world's top dairy producers, has always denied any connection to the mafia, but never-before-seen documents obtained by Radio Canada's program Enquête show a clandestine relationship until the late 1970s with Joe Bonanno, longtime boss of a New York crime family. Mary Maud Denis has the details. Lino Saputo published his autobiography last fall. He tells how he transformed a small family cheese business into a multinational empire. He also dismisses past allegations of ties to organized crime, just like in this interview we aired 12 years ago. Jamais, soit de près ou de loin, la mafia est associée avec Saputo. But enquête reporter Gaetan Pouliot uncovered documents used by the New York State Department of Agriculture in the 80s. It turned down Lino Saputo's request for a milk dealer's license. Its decision was based on ties between Saputo and Joe Bonanno. 
He was the longtime head of the mafia in the United States. His address is 255. And Retired Arizona police officer Gene Emmon was a key witness in the New York State case. He showed us where Joe Bonanno used to live. For more than three years in the 70s, he would take Bonanno's garbage and search it. We learned by both studying him and watching him that he was the most powerful mafioso in the United States and had specific influence, we learned, in Canada. In the trash, police found ripped up notes. They stuck them together and found the name Lino several times. Police found out later they referred to Lino Saputo. And we eventually found, through picking up the notes, that he had a hidden financial interest in Saputo cheese. And that was a, a secret interest that was held away from the public. In Bonanno's garbage, police also found Saputo company financial records and proof of a cash transfer to Joe Bonanno. In 1980, the retired judge who turned down Lino Saputo's New York State license request wrote, Joseph Bonanno has had significant economic and transactional involvement over a substantial period of years with several Canadian cheese companies owned by the members of the Saputo family and by Lino Saputo in particular. All of this contradicts what Quebec's richest man wrote in his autobiography. Lino Saputo refused our request for an interview. However, in a written statement, his lawyer told CBC Mr. Saputo has never had, either directly or indirectly, any connection to organized crime. Marimo Denis, CBC News, Montreal. And we will be right back with more news on the national. At issue is next on the conservative leadership race, the candidates who've thrown their hats into the ring, plus a former prime minister behind the scenes. And later, a snowball fight delayed by too much snow is tonight's moment. Welcome back. Here are some other stories making news around the world tonight. There it is, much needed rain coming down in Australia. Up to 50 millimeters fell across parts of the states of New South Wales and Victoria, where firefighters are battling dozens of fires. More rain is in the forecast, but officials warn it could cause flash flooding as the massive fires have burned through the vegetation that would normally soak up the water. And another Major League Baseball manager has stepped down as the league's so-called sign-stealing scandal continues to grow. The New York Mets announced today that they had agreed to part ways with Carlos Beltran. The former outfielder was named in an MLB report that found the Houston Astros stole pitching signs in 2017, the year they won the World Series. The deadline is set and the rules announced, and the race for the next Conservative Party leader is officially on. There are the candidates we know are running, those we expect to announce soon or still considering, and then there's the one we just don't know. But there are also changes happening behind the scenes. Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper resigned from the Conservative Fund's board, raising questions about his role during the leadership contest. Okay, so what does this first week tell us, if anything, about the race so far, and how will this contest be different from the last one? It's Thursday, and at issue is here. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal, Andrew Coyne is in Toronto, and Althea Raj is in Ottawa tonight. Good to see everybody. I, I, I want to start a little bit on the rules, not, you know, the get into the details, but the fact that the entrance fee is the highest ever, uh, that there's some that, that's refundable, some that's not, that you have to get 3,000 signatures. That already changes the nature of how this race is going to unfold, and we've already seen that this week. Uh, Chantal, you start us off. Yes, uh, I, I, it's clearly meant to provide a disincentive to anyone who would have wanted to use uh, the leadership campaign to raise his or her profile. Uh, the bar is set too high uh, on, on all kinds of scores for that to happen. Uh, that probably means that it will be a smaller field than the happy dozen or so that we saw mm -hmm. last time. And is that a, a good thing, Andrew, or...? Well, it's not a particularly democratic thing. I mean, it will also exclude people who might not be able to raise a lot of money out of the gate, but might have a great message or an appealing mm. uh, campaign persona and might be able to catch fire. So 
you've got these rules that have profound implications for favoring one type of candidate over another type of candidate that are basically being set by a, a bunch of appointees sitting in a back room somewhere. Uh, it's a hell of a way to run a railroad, frankly. Well, two things. One, it's clear that there is a desire, especially among those in the upper echelons of the party, to elect, choose a leader quickly that has already name recognition across the country in the yeah. case that the government falls and that there's an election. There isn't a lot of groundwork to do. And so in some ways, you can look at these rules and say, uh, they seem to be designed for that. That being said, the rules are kind of progressive. You only need a 1,000 signatures from the get-go, you only right. need to put in $25,000 immediately. So there are, I mean, there are different steps to reach along the way. So technically, I do think that there is a potential that you could get new voices should those individuals wish to come out of the woodwork. Um, you know, you also want to be able to choose a leader that can raise money. It's so fundamental that if yeah. you can't raise 300000 frankly, like, that's not that much money. The the max now is almost 1700 per person. So. Right. I think the better rule I would have liked to see would be that you have to have the support of a certain number of members of caucus, because right. that is who the leader is ultimately going to have to lead. That is who he or she should be accountable to on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this business of having leadership races where you have membership drives with tens of thousands of new members who come out of nowhere and disappear the day after they vote <laughs> uh, is what keeps saddling parties with leaders who are repugnant to the caucus and wind up getting in trouble for the party. Okay, let, let's uh, talk. Yeah, go ahead, Chantal. Uh, two things. First, someone who, who would be the aspiring prime minister, maybe in 18 months, uh, should be someone who brings enough experience. It's not an entry-level position. Yes. Second thing, I'm not sure that the system brings repugnant leaders, or at least I suspect that the liberals, for one, would beg to differ uh, <laughs> on the score of having had Justin Trudeau elected as leader at a time when they were in third place and being predicted. Uh, to be going nowhere first. Well, what it, what it does in that case is you get a leader who's accountable to nobody. Uh, but what we've seen is you've got leaders like Andrew Scheer, who, who basically got elected by a bunch of dairy farmers from Quebec who did not have the best interest of the Conservative Party in mind. You had the progression of Patrick Brown in the Ontario Conservative Party and then Doug Ford in the Conservative yeah. Party. You get people being elected by a bunch of people who have no real connection or attachment to the party who come in solely on the basis of mass uh, membership sales. It's not a sound way. It's not the way other countries run their leadership races. I don't think it's one that really okay. stands the test of scrutiny I, in Canada. Okay, can I okay, just say I that's not really fair about Andrew okay, Scheer. I mean, the dairy farmers last might point have inflated I want to talk about running. Go uh, ahead. Yeah. his standings early on, but he was the consensus candidate of, who, of people who, uh, you know, were members at the time. You don't get to the you know twelfth round ballot or whatever it was um, in 2017 without having pretty deep support in the party. Well, and social uh, conservatives certainly pushed him over the edge too. Okay. I, 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 this is all great. I, I, it's great you have no <laughs> opinions whatsoever about this. <laughs> no. But what about the, what about the people uh, who are running so far? Two names that are out there, and then the other names that are sort of floating around uh, for now. What, what does that tell us about what kind of race this might be, Chantal? Eva? It does not yet tell us much of anything yeah. uh, because we are in what I would call the, the fake war period of the leadership yeah. campaign, where everyone and his sister or brother. <laughs> uh, under the cover of anonymity will be close to someone and tell you something that maybe is not true because yes. they're not really close to someone. And <laughs> we, the media, are actually peddling all this stuff. Uh, absent uh, words, you know, this week, he, he, if you read all the stories that came out, regardless of what they said, you would think that the cat ate uh, the tongue of Ronald Ambrose, Jean Charest, and that everyone needs to talk on their behalf. So we, we are not anywhere near what this is shaping up to be like. That, 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 would be, that would be fair, I think, Andrew, that everybody's talking, but not actually the people that plan to run or are thinking about running. Sure, but what I think you can say as the broad outline, because it's true of most leadership races, is the party's dilemma, as it is for many parties, is that oftentimes the candidate that can win the party can't win the general election, and yeah. vice versa. The party that can win the general election, leader, the le candidate who can win the general election can't win the party. Mm -hmm. You've got candidates like Jean Charest and Peter McKay, who might be quite attractive to... Uh, centrist voters, not necessarily hardcore conservatives, but who've got a real h hard road to hoe to sell themselves to the, to the membership at large, particularly in Western Canada. You can see them already trying to buttress their conservative, small-c conservative credentials by hiring people who've got that kind of right-wing voice and connections, but they, they themselves are going to have a real uh, selling job in that regard. Althea? 
I say, if you were reading the stories this week, you would uh, conclude that there are people, whether it's one camp or two camps, who really don't want Jean Charest to run. Yes. Uh, you know, the first, the leak about uh, his connections to Huawei, and now the story that Harper has resigned from the Conservative Fund so that he can prevent or campaign against Jean Charest, which I'm told by people close to the former prime minister that that is hogwash. Um, it is very interesting that there's already an attack against a candidate that hasn't even declared. Yeah, I wonder what that tells us, because I, I mean, I was told the same thing about Stephen Harper and the Conservative Fund, but at the same time, people are very willing to talk to you about how much he dislikes Jean Charest uh, for personal reasons uh, that our friend Paul Wells has, has talked about, uh, but also for ideological reasons. So, I, I, what, I mean, does that show us that Jean Charest is a real threat or that Stephen Harper is overly interested in the future of the party? I mean, what does that tell us? Go ahead, two, uh, two things. Uh, yeah. The first, yes, Jean Charest is a real threat to a number of the other candidates. And yes, he does represent in the eye of many, and I suspect that would include Stephen Harper, uh, a kind of, of reverse takeover by the former progressive wing of the party, of right. the reins of power within the party. Uh, that being said, Stephen Harper would not be the first former leader to feel that the uh, uh, front runner or a possible front runner is not the person that is best to keep the soul of the party intact. And I bring you back to Ed Broadbent, who campaigned quite openly for someone other than Thomas Mulcair, in part because yeah. he made no secret of the fact he didn't believe Thomas Mulcair should be uh, Jack Layton's successor. So what, what do I'm you told think? The, yeah, go oh, ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Althea. I was going to say, ahead. I'm told the yeah. expectation is that, that the former prime minister is actually probably not going to campaign actively for a candidate. And obviously, there's no, I would say, uh, huge feelings of warmth between Jean Charest and Stephen Harper, but we are also likely going to see a leadership race with at least three, possibly four, former Harper cabinet ministers. Um, uh, why would he be campaigning for Jean Charest when there's yeah. people from his own team, including people that he has rather warm relationships with who are yeah. running for this job? Yeah, but but it's one thing to not campaign for someone. It's another thing to campaign against someone. Yeah, I don't and, think and, that's going to uh, happen. Well, I don't know, but it can, it can happen through whispers. It can happen through people. Like, yeah. the fact that we even know that this is something that people are talking but, about is, is but, probably not a good sign. Because they want us to talk about it. Yes, 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 that's fine. That's fine, <laughs> Andrew. It's, and, not, and, it's well, not unprecedented. No, it's it not unprecedented. Happened. Fair. It will happen. Fair. It's not the end of the world. It's all part of a succession <laughs> battle. Okay, Andrew, weigh in. It'd be remarkable to see Harper actually publicly campaigning. I doubt we'll see that. He may yeah. make uh, representations behind the scenes, but I can't see why he would see Sherry as being that much of a threat. Uh, he's got a, a, he's not a particularly conservative person to begin with. His record is not particularly conservative. He's got more than a whiff of corruption surrounding the government that he led in Quebec, and if, if not him personally. Uh, he's got this Huawei business where he's been a consultant to the company that is at the heart of this business where China is holding our hostages. Uh, he's got so many knocks against him that I think he's, to say that he's the front runner, I think would be really pushing it at this point. Uh, he's not running that. yet in any nah. No, no. Okay, well, one, one quick round on, on Rana Ambrose. What do you think, Chantal, if you had to bet? Uh, I've heard uh, black and white on this, uh, yeah. but at some point uh, it is clear that she will be or have to say something, yes. and it seems to me that if she hasn't yet, uh, it's because she is or has been tempted. Because otherwise, it's easy enough to rule yourself out. It sure. only takes seven words <laughs> on the social media <laughs> to run or not to run. So yes. Yes. Uh, I, I, I've looked at her social media feed. I noticed that the last entry six days ago is about John Crosby. Yes. It's not a bad thing to be right next to someone who was uh, identified as a major red Tory. Whatever you may be thinking about your future. 30 seconds, Andrew and, and Althea, you got to share it. Andrew. Well, th I think a candidate like Ron Ambrose is what a lot of people are looking for, which is somebody with credibility in the West who can also reach out to Central Canada. And so far, we haven't seen candidates who can bridge that divide, mm -hmm. I think, very effectively. Whether Ronna Ambrose is the person is another matter. Althea. She has a very nice life at the moment, and she now needs to weigh whether she will regret not jumping into this contest, and I think that's why we have not heard from her yet. That being said, a lot of people do really want her to win, uh, run, because they believe that she can win against Justin Trudeau, and they are not convinced that uh, the rest of the people we're talking about can. 
The number of politicians that leave their nice lives for politics are a lot. So we'll Ambition. see whether she all Ambition. It's <laughs> That's all so I interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Good conversation. We'll talk many more times about all this, of course. Be sure to uh, subscribe to Add Issue, the podcast, where we put some extra content. This week, we will talk a little bit more about the government's response to the downing of Flight 752 and those ongoing tensions with Iran. Look for it on any major podcast app, our website, cbc.ca slash the national. And time for a quick break. Up next, what could having a royal couple living in Canada cost Canadians? We look at the security and the price tag next. Adam will play in the uh, physical disability. When did you grow this? I, I said I would grow until Brexit was sorted. <laughs> okay, we'll come back to that. <laughs> a cheery Prince Harry sharing a laugh with Australian comedian Adam Hills at Buckingham Palace today for the Rugby League World Cup team draw. It's his first official appearance since the Queen agreed to Harry and Meghan's request to take a step back from royal duties. And while Harry charms people back in London, Meghan is already here in Canada, where the royal couple can probably expect a largely warm welcome, as long as Canadians don't have to pay for them being here. Ellen Morrow looks at what the couple's royal relocation means for this country. Harry and Meghan at Canada House before making Canada home. For many Canadians, it's impolite to talk about costs for guests. But what if those guests weren't really invited and decided to stay? What kind of security costs are we looking at here? We're talking about a fence, we're talking about cameras, we're talking about alarm systems, we're talking about early detection systems, uh, we're talking about intelligent officers that are looking for uh, immediate uh, concerns and threats throughout the world. This contractor says security costs could run anywhere from two to more than $10 million. You need to compare it, the royal family, to the prime minister. It's most likely going to have to have the same protection that the prime minister has. Canadians don't know yet if they'll be on the hook, but 73% don't think Canada should fork over a loony, according to a new survey. In the same poll, 45% said Canada should no longer be a constitutional monarchy. The idea that their tax dollars are going to support uh, a very wealthy family because of a private life choice, uh, I think is going to strike a lot of people uh, in a very bad way. Harry and Meghan's presence here, though, could mean royal returns for Brand Canada. We're talking about a level, a, a megawatt level of star power. This is a no-brainer in terms of the amount of positive brand attention and in a very practical sense, tourism, that, uh, that this could bring us. Megan has boosted Canadian fashion designers in the past. She was also praised this week for visiting two Vancouver charities. And this was her volunteering at Toronto's St. Felix Centre back in 2014. When people who have that enormous platform use it in positive ways, that's incredibly impactful for us. There's still few details on the couple's plans, where they'll live, and how Canadians will react if forced to pay for their security. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. So tomorrow night, we will try to answer your questions about the royal couple moving here. We're convening a special panel of royal and constitutional experts. So send us your questions to the national at cbc.ca, or you can send us a message on Instagram. We'll be right back with tonight's moment. Just two nights ago, we showed you how Calgary was too cold even for the penguins. The Calgary Zoo had to cancel their popular daily walk because the city was colder than the South Pole. Well, the weather-related irony just continued yesterday when the University of British Columbia canceled its epic annual snowball fight because there was too much snow. Well, it went ahead today, and their mayhem is our moment. The fact that the snowball fight got canceled because of the snow is absolutely hilarious, and I think describes Vancouver very well. <laughs> Once we got the notification from the university that the school is gonna be closed, we thought it'd be best to postpone to today. <laughs> And I think people were really happy to hear that because it's such a big event that happens every year that it'd be a shame if it got cancelled. The snow that today was just perfect snowball snow. So it worked out really well in our favor and also gave students a little bit more time to get extra excited. Okay, 
I really, really would like to do that, <laughs> firstly. Yeah. Um, but as, as huge as those numbers are, it seems like there's about 1,000 people there. I was just reading that last year there were 3,000 people. <laughs> so three times as many people yeah. last year lining and just tossing snow at each other. It's fantastic. I will say this. So, so it sounds like it would be fun to be there. Yes. Except there's always, and I swear this is true every year, there's always kind of like a random group of people who come armed to the teeth. So it's not just, you know, friendly neighborhood snowball fights. Some people will bring shields and umbrellas, oh, yes, yeah. like body armor type things. I would and, too. And you're not going to win against those guys. <laughs> so so uh, best of luck to you. Prepared. Yeah, no kidding. That's The National for this January 16th. Have a great Good night. <laughs>